All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining ARA's webinar Wednesday presentation. Um, pleased to uh, have all of you with us today. Uh, my name is Mike Harrell. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar uh, entitled Communication Tips for Engineers and Scientists. Uh, this webinar is going to be recorded, uh, in fact, is recording now, and we will have that recording uh, available for review uh, on our webinar web Wednesday website. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have an issue with sound and are using your computer speakers, uh, please dial in using a phone instead. And if you have another issue, please use the chat button to send a message to the host and make sure you select host for the recipient of that message. Uh, next slide, please. If you have questions for uh, the panelists uh, after the presentation has, uh, has finished, Please click on the Q&A button and send your question to the host and panelists, and we will address these in the Q&A session directly after the presentation. Next slide, please. To view the presentation in full screen, at the top of your webinar settings, click on the down arrow, highlight View, then choose Fit to Viewer. And there is just a reminder that to receive a one-hour PDH certificate, you must attend the full one-hour webinar, and more information will be provided at the end of the presentation for that. Next slide, please. Now I would like to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, uh, Kevin Elliott. Kevin Elliott is a Senior Marketing and communication Specialist with Applied Research Associates. He creates strategic communication plans and manages creative design projects for clients including the Federal Highway Administration, the Florida Department of Transportation, the South Dakota Department of Transportation, Ohio Department of Transportation, and several others. He is also a university communication professor and a nationally sought public speaker and teacher. He has spoken to groups across the country including the National, Local, and Tribal Technical Assistance Program Association, uh, the NLTAPA, uh, and at their annual meeting, as well as the National Association of County Engineers, NACE's national meeting, National Center for Rural Road Safety National Summit, the Texas Transportation Safety Summit, the FHWA Office of Safety Annual Retreat, and more than 10 local LTAPs. And now I will turn the presentation over to my colleague and friend, Kevin Elliott. Thank you, Mike. Mike, I want to confirm with you just a minute before I jump in. Is my audio sounding okay? You sound great, Kevin. Okay, very good. I just want to make sure I'm not, not breaking up there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day. I'm going to move through the slide as quickly as possible so you don't have to keep looking at my face. But this is me. I wish we were in person so we could look at each other and talk to each other and read body language and all the things we, we miss, I think, over the last couple of years. But I do appreciate you, you all attending. I was looking at the attendee list before we got on, and there is a lot of variety of technical people, which just thrills me. It's so, I'm, it's so good to see the interest in this topic. And so, but I do, I know it comes out of work day. So thank you very much. I am from Panama City, Florida. I do still live in Panama City, Florida. It's where I'm sitting right now. If you know where that is, it's in the, the panhandle of Florida up in the north, uh, the part of Florida that most people don't know about. We're in Central Time. We're just south of Alabama. It's kind of weird, but we love it here, and that's where I am currently sitting. I have a master's degree in corporate and public communication, um, and I have a marketing background. So I, I have worked for advertising firms and marketing firms. And that is my passion, my expertise, my education, and my experience. So I brought that into this work. I've been with ARA just over six years and helping technical folks apply those principles of marketing that I learned in those other things. I also raise chickens. So I have, uh, we're pretty rural up here in North Florida, and I have about 15 chickens in my backyard. And I, that's always a conversation starter. So, if there are already chicken people out there, and I know there are, 
because we are everywhere. We are a subculture. Uh, feel free to reach out to me and let's talk about chickens. But most importantly, for the purposes of this presentation, is I want you to know that I'm not just a marketing guy or I'm not just a corporate I work with engineers and scientists every single day. This is what I do. I help technical people communicate their work, communicate with each other, communicate with their audiences. This is my entire job at ARA. And so I, I love this niche of communication. I love working with technical people. I love it that we're so different in it that we help each other. So I just wanted you to know that this, this is my job. The goal for this session, here's what, I only have two big ones that I want to accomplish in the next few minutes. The first one is, I want to bust the extrovert myth. And it is a myth, Alex, that you have to be an extrovert to be a good communicator. That you have to be an extrovert to do sales, to do marketing, to communicate to the public. None of that is true. It is a total myth, and I'm going to bust it here in just a few minutes but also give you some good news for those of you who are not extroverted. And as you know, in the technical fields, lots and lots of people are not. They are, it is, it, this field attracts more introverted people. But there is some good news for you. So that's the first goal. Second, I'm going to give you three very practical tips, things you can do that will improve your communication instantly. And I mean instantly. It's not hype. I'm, it's not some, you know, marketing guy overselling. If you do these things, you will be better in your very next presentation or your very next public meeting or your very next sales meeting, what, I don't, whatever it is you are doing, you will be better. So those are the goals for the session. Let's jump right in. First of all, I am a college professor and so I can't help it. I have to give out reading assignments. <laughs> Here is your reading assignment for this project. But also, this is where I got a lot of the information I'm about to share with you. There are two books in this field that I recommend to everyone, especially to technical people and technically minded people. The first one is called Good in a Room. Stephanie Palmer worked for years and years at MGM Studios, at the movie studio. And her job was to listen to movie pitches. People would come in, I have this idea, I want money from the studio to make my movie. And she saw thousands of pitches. And what she started to notice was that the best story or the best idea did not always get turned into a movie, did not, did not, not always get greenlit, as they call it. They didn't, they didn't get money. And then she saw other stories that were not as good get greenlit. They got money. They were made. And what she realized was it wasn't so much the story as it was when they were in the room with a decision maker, they could sell their idea. They could explain. They could communicate their idea better. And so they got many more yeses than the other people who could not communicate as well. In other words, they were good in a room when they got into the room with a decision maker. So outstanding book to teach you how to communicate your ideas. The second one is where I got a lot of the guts of this presentation. It's called To Sell is Human. Um, Daniel Pink is a very well-known persuasion teacher and scholar and writer. And he breaks down in very practical ways what makes, what motivates people to actually take actions. And then he explains how to work with people to take the actions that are in their best interest. Because at the end of the day, that's what good ethical sales is, is you are matching someone with something that will benefit them. It's not the sleepy used car salesman, the, the cliche. And so a lot of what I'm about to explain came out of that book, and I highly recommend that you read it. The first thing I pulled out of that book is this idea of the extrovert myth. I hear this a lot when I work with technical people with engineers and scientists, and I do a lot of public speaking with these folks and to these folks. And a very common comment I get is, well, listen, you're very extroverted, right? You're extroverted, so it's just kind of natural to you to talk to people, and it's natural to you to explain these things. I'm introverted. I'm painfully introverted. I, I went into engineering or science 
because I was introverted and I did not want, I didn't have those skills, I didn't want, to, I, I can't do this. I'm not an extrovert. I hear that a lot. I, I always discounted that idea, but I never quite had the, the reasoning to say that's not totally true. Well, Daniel Pink gave that to me. And in his book, he explains why the idea that extroverts are better communicators is simply a myth. It is, it is absolutely not true. In his book, he, he describes three kinds of people, and two of these you're going to recognize, and one of them was new to me, and I, maybe new to you. The first one is the extrovert. This is, this is the glad hander. This is the back slapper. This is the guy that's at the meeting, and he's out there talking to everybody. This person thrives on being around people, thrives on the energy of a crowd, wants to be around folks all the time. As you know, most technical people are not that way. That is not their expertise. And it might surprise you to find out that that is not even my expertise. It's not even my personality type. I am a relatively introverted guy. If I take the test, when, when I take those tests, I always, I always come over on the introverted side of things. I have just developed a set of skills that allows me to communicate. But this is the, this is the classic, you know, person who's out there. And we think, and the myth is that this person is just a better communicator than the rest of us. By nature, this person gets more results. This person does better sales, all that. That's the extrovert. The other side of the spectrum is the introvert. This is the person, never let me, never put me in front of people. I don't want to be around a crowd. It exhausts me to be around a crowd of people. It exhausts me to make small talk. I don't know what to say to people. It gives me panic attacks. All of those things. I just want to sit in my cubicle with my spreadsheets and do my job. That's the introvert. Okay. If this crowd I'm talking to, and I wish I could see your faces, how you're responding right now, but if I had to guess, a lot of you lean this way. You lean more toward the introvert side of things. Fair enough. And the idea or the myth is that these people cannot communicate well. It's just not in me. It's not in my DNA. I don't know how to speak to a group. I can't articulate the ideas that's in my head. I just can't do this. Only the extroverts can do it. Well, Daniel Pink says, no, there's a third kind of person. And based on research, this kind of person is actually a very effective communicator, and most of the human population falls into this category, and it's called an ambivert. An ambivert. This person is kind of like the Goldilocks personality. It has a little bit of the extroverted, has a little bit of the introverted. And when they do studies, and they have done studies, when you do the research on this, and you say, okay, of these three personality types, with, and, and, and specifically with sales, which one does the better job? Which one makes the most sales? Every time they do the studies and every time they do the research, they find out that the ambivert is the top seller. This person is the most effective communicator. Now, that was, that was what I was looking for when I would always talk to people and they would say, oh, but you're extroverted. And I would, no, actually, I'm not. I know I'm not. But I am an ambivert. I will say that. And so this person requires a little bit of research. We need to know about this person. But first of all, let's talk about the flaws of the extrovert and the introvert. What makes them, what, what inhibits their effectiveness to communicate effectively? The first thing is the ambiverts, yes, they're outgoing. Yes, they're in a crowd all the time. And yes, they like to be around people, but they talk too much. They, they overwhelm an audience. They are overbearing. We've all experienced this person. You're sitting at a table, and the person just won't stop talking. They won't ask a question. They won't let you respond. And they won't let you get a word in edgewise. Well, now think about that. Is that really effective communication? Just because words are coming out of the person's mouth doesn't mean it's effective, and it doesn't mean that person is moving others. They're just talking too much. By definition, if they're talking too much, they're listening too little or not at all. They're just not paying attention to the body language of the crowd. You've all seen this. You've seen a public speaker where they don't read the room. That's the term, right? They'll say something that either the crowd disagrees with or they don't understand or whatever, and the person just keeps going. They don't even notice because they are just, they're only worried about getting the words out of their mouth. And third, this person tells instead of asks. Asking questions of people is crucial 
to moving them into effective communication. And I'll explain here in just a minute. So this person is all outward. It's all just talking, 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 taking no information in, only giving it out. The introvert on the other side won't engage. Will just sit in the corner and never just doesn't want to talk to anyone. Listens too much, and that is a problem. You will just sit there and you'll take it all in, but you will never ever respond back. You will never contribute anything to the conversation. You just you are just taking information in. And then third, won't ask questions. Will not engage people and get information back from them, and back and forth and back and forth. This is the flaw in these two people. And when they do the studies, they realize that these two people are not the best salespeople, but this person is. So let's talk about this ambivert, this Goldilocks, just the right temperature person. Daniel Pink uh, describes a term he calls attunement. What ambiverts are very good at is what they call attunement. And just like the word sounds, it is this person can get in tune, can attune themselves to their audience. That is a major advantage for these people because to persuade people or to explain or to engage people, they need to feel like you are in sync with them. That's the term we use. When you, when you talk to somebody and you just click, right, you just click, you are attuned to one another, you just get each other. These are the terms that we use to describe attunement. And you've seen this in a public speaking event or whatever, that speaker will just lock in with the rhythms of that crowd, will just somehow know what to say and, the, and it just feels right. Well, that's called attunement. And it's not done by luck and it's not done by chance. You can actually develop skills to be better attuned to your audience. That's what ambiverts do well and it's why they get the results that they do. First of all, they listen, so they're not talking all the time, they're paying attention, they're watching, they're listening, but then they will follow up with questions. Tell me more about this. You said that, uh, a minute ago you said this, hey, can you explain what you meant there? Let me ask you a follow-up. They engage, in other words. It's conversation, it, it's transactional, it goes back and forth. That is key because then you pull somebody into your conversation, you're not overwhelming them, but by asking them questions, you have shown two things. One, that you have listened to them. You truly listened to what they were saying. And two, that you value information. You want information from them. You value them. If a person feels like they have been listened to and they are valued, they will pay attention to you. They will engage with you, and you are already 80% of the way to have, to have persuading them, to having them take the action that you want them to take. And the verts are also very good at responding to body language. They pay attention. They're looking at, so if they say something, this is, this is one of my major handicaps as a public speaker, I can't see you right now. And it kills me that I can't see my crowd. And I can't tell if what I'm saying is resonating. And I can't tell if you understood what I just said or if you disagree. If I'm in a room and I see you, I can respond to those things. I can say you cross your arms and I can see you lean back or I can see you look at your watch and I know, okay, I need to speed things up. Okay, maybe they disagreed. I can respond. The very best communicators are constantly watching their audience, whether it's one person or 500 people, for cues to know how to attune their language and attune their messaging in real time to the people they are talking to. That is crucial. That's why you feel like you have been in sync. It's very much like dancing. You get into a rhythm. I say some things, and then I watch you for your response, and then I adjust, and then I get information from you. That is crucial to good communication. And third, they have empathy, and they do what they call perspective taking. Ambiverts can imagine what other people are thinking. So just because, so for instance, I do a lot of public speaking. I teach public speaking at college. I, I, I've done this for 25 years. And it's very easy for me to assume or to forget that you don't know things that I know. And I don't know things that you know. And so when you're talking to me, it's very easy for you to start explaining things as if I know what you know. And we have a disconnect. 
So empathy and perspective taking means as a communicator, you try to imagine, okay, where, where would my audience misunderstand this information? Where would my audience need more clarification? Take their perspective. We all want to feel heard. We all want to feel understood. And if you can communicate that you understand their perspective, people instantly respond. That is empathy. That makes us, that bonds human beings together. And that is what you're trying to do. That's what ambiverts have learned how to do. And then last, they will ask, what do you think about that? They'll say something, and they'll go, what do you all think? What do you think about that? If I were in a room with you right now, if we were all sitting out there and looking at each other in a live room, I would literally do that. I'd say, what do you all think about this? Does this make any sense to you? Does this resonate with you? I would, I would get a response back from you. And then I would adjust or maybe ask questions in the moment if somebody had a question. That is what good ambiverts do. And you're in attunement. And now everybody feels like they're playing together. That is everything. That is key to being ambiverted. Here's the good news. The big fear of introverts, and I know this because a lot of you have told me this, the big fear is that, oh my gosh, I have to become an extrovert I, to be a successful communicator. I have to somehow get out there. I, I'm never going to be able to do that. Well, good news. You don't have to. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it wouldn't even be good if you did. And for the extroverts, it doesn't mean you have to never talk. It doesn't mean you have to totally shut off your personality. You just have to come a little closer to the middle, toward the ambiverted, just curve it a little bit, ask a few more questions, listen a little bit more. And if you're introverted, you just have to come to the center. You have to move a little bit more, ask a question. You don't have to become an extrovert. You don't have to become the life of the party. That's a myth. It is not true. You can be completely introverted, very reserved, very shy even, and be a very effective, effective communicator. I have seen it happen. You just have to learn the skills of an ambivert and adjust a little bit, and you will instantly get better. So that, I hope that explains and maybe is some good news and takes some weight off of you and encourages you introverts out there that, you know what, I can do this. I don't have to be lampshade on the head guy at every party. I can be me, and with just a few improvements in my skills, I can be a more effective communicator, because you can. You absolutely can. So, my pro tips. Let me give you some specific pro tips that will instantly help you get better as you start to improve your skills. The first one is to use analogies. We all probably know what an analogy is, but I'll explain in a minute. But analogies are one of the most effective tools for communicating complex subjects especially to non-technical audiences. So if part of your job requires you to talk to non-engineers and non-scientists, I do a lot of work in transportation. And I know DOTs especially, but even FHWA and certainly local agencies are always trying, they have to go to public meetings about a project or they have to talk to um, a board of directors or a leadership or a commission or whatever it is, and they have to explain their work in non-technical terms. It's really hard. But one of the most effective things you can do is to use analogies. And I'm going to give you an example and some, and some tips on that as we get in there. Second tip is to explain it to grandma. I will explain what that means when we get to there. So explain it to grandma. Third, you want to visualize, but you want to visualize well. Just putting visuals on a screen is not visualizing. As a matter of fact, if you don't visualize well and put a bunch of visuals up there, you can really detract. You can do the opposite of what you think you are doing. You can make it worse. So I'm going to show you some ways to visualize technical data and the, and the sort of ways that you communicate as technical people, the tools you have, how to use them better. The first, using analogies. How do you explain systemic analysis? Now, I don't, I don't, I have probably have, I don't know if I have clients on this call or not. I don't know if Jerry Rochi from FACWA is on the call, but if, hello Jerry. The, I, I always, this is my favorite case study in using analogies. And I love the story behind this, uh, not only because it, it's an effective, it, it became a very effective analogy that we use, but because it was enlightening to me uh, as a non-technical person. So 
systemic analysis, if you don't know, it's a transportation thing, and it is used particularly on rural roadway networks. And my job at the time was to help FHWA communicate systemic analysis to state and local agencies across the country. And I was struggling. I was really, I wasn't getting it. And so they, they kept explaining it to me, what systemic analysis was, and I just, it wasn't sinking in. And then I was on a call with Jerry, my client, and I was frustrated. I'm like, Jerry, I'm sorry. I just don't, I'm not understanding this concept. And, I'm, and I can't help you communicate it if I can't get it. And then Jerry hit on a beautiful analogy that instantly helped me understand this. And we, it was so good that we used it, we've used it across the country to help people understand this very complex topic. But if you were to explain systemic analysis, transportation analysis, to people in words, in the technical way, it would go like this. You look at your roadway system and you review the crash history of your roadway system. Where have the crashes happened on our roadways in the last, say, three to five years? You then identify roadway features that correlate with those severe crashes. Curves, uh, rumble strips, are there shoulders, is there a drop-off? Roadway features that correlate with severe crashes. You then evaluate your system to identify other locations with those, those features, and then you deploy countermeasures to those locations proactively. That is the literal description of what systemic analysis is. Now, you as a technical person may have understood every single bit of that right off the bat, but I can tell you that non-technical audiences and people who are not as well-versed in this stuff do not understand it. So, you don't want to start with that. Thinking about how you can use an analogy, what would be a good analogy to explain systemic analysis. And I was on the phone one day with Jerry, like I said, oh, Jerry, Jerry, man, I'm sorry, I don't get it. I'm not, I'm not understanding it. He said, Kevin, listen, it's like going to the doctor. It's like a doctor visit. When you go to the doctor, what is the first thing they do? They take a family history. They want to know, does diabetes run in your family? What about heart disease? And they do a, they do a workup. Then they ask you about your personal health habits. They go, do you smoke? How much do you exercise? What's your diet like? They are running a history on you. They are looking for risk factors, factors that are in your body that predispose you to certain kinds of illnesses or diseases. And the doctor knows if the doctor can find that risk factor and treat the risk factor, they can prevent the disease. So think of it, now let's go back to systemic analysis and go, okay, think of it like a doctor visit. I look over my system and I see where we have had crashes before. Something like heart attacks run in your family. You go, okay, great. What are the symptoms of a heart attack? Well, they are cholesterol and all the other blood pressure, all those things at certain levels. Okay, great. Let's look around our system. And every one of these crashes, or most of them, have happened on a, on a sharp curve. Okay, there's a risk factor for severe crashes on my... Why don't we go to all of our sharp curves and put Chevron signs or rumble strips or something like that? Let's mitigate the risk factor. We can prevent a crash. We can prevent a disease. And the light bulb clicked on, and I totally understood systemic analysis. It was beautiful. So from that, what we did was this. We visualized that analogy, and we put it on this flyer. We have made it into a video. We fold it into all of our communications on systemic analysis, and it has worked like a charm all across the country. We have printed thousands of these things. And you look at it, some people look at it and go, what do you mean a cartoon? I go, yeah, totally, a cartoon. It has worked like crazy. People say, oh, oh, I get it. And then they will describe it back to us now. Systemic analysis is like a doctor visit. A simple analogy completely unlocked this technical idea. And it can do the same thing for your communications. If you are trying to think about, okay, how can we communicate what we do, think of analogies. Analogies are great because they make you boil down what you're trying to say. They make you really think about the essence of what it is you're communicating, which is key to being a communicator. What is the one thing you want me to understand about this right now? And then I can always research more. So you have to boil it down. And the other great thing that an analogy does is it, it bridges known to unknown. It starts with something you understand, a doctor visit. 
We've all done that. We, we understand that idea. And then it uses that idea to bridge over to something maybe you don't know about, like systemic analysis. And then you go, oh, I see the connections. It works in the human brain really, really well. And if you'll notice, look, I just used two more analogies <laughs> to, to explain analogies. We use these things all the time. You should purposely use analogies to help you explain complex ideas. Your audiences will absolutely engage with you, understand more, and they will feel like you are more attuned to them. Next, explain it to grandma. Okay, look, here's grandma. Here's grandma and grandpa. Thanksgiving is coming up. We're all going to have these, if you have these family meetings and your grandma and grandpa come or your aunt and your uncle or whoever it is, we all get together with our friends and family around this time of year and, and we have the normal conversation. They say, so what have you been doing at work this year? <laughs> so if you are a technical person and your family, if your grandma is a non-technical person, what do you say to her? How do you explain what you do to grandma? Now, if grandma is an engineer or a scientist, well then, fine. You talk to her in engineering and scientist words and concepts. How, how would you explain your job to your grandmother, who may not have a clue what you do and couldn't understand all the technical things? Okay, every time you're talking to, a, especially a non-technical audience, but even sometimes technical audiences, don't assume they know everything. Explain it to them as if you're explaining it to your grandma. And he, here are some, some tips. First of all, define your terms. That goes for acronyms. You, you throw a new acronym out there, do not assume people know this. When you, have, when you are talking to an audience and you're, you're introducing new terms, always ask if they know what that means. Do you all know what this word means? Do I need to do and define those terms. You don't want to talk down to people, but you also don't want to assume they know the word you are. If they don't know your vocabulary, they will understand nothing else about what you're going to say. So, the, so, so, so Grandma, if I were doing, for instance, I work in transportation communication a lot. We do a lot of communication around roundabouts. And if I were to say, Grandma, uh, I've done a lot, of, a, a lot of work around roundabouts. Do you, do you, have you seen a roundabout? You know what a roundabout is? And she's going to say one or two things. No, I'm not sure. Or, oh, yeah, 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 I drove through one the other day. You go, okay, great, we're on the same page. We are attuned. See, now you're attuning yourself. She understands the terms. So always define your terms as you introduce them into your presentation, including acronyms. Do not assume people understand your alphabet suit of acronyms. They likely do not. Next, emphasize benefits over features. Now, this is a, a marketing strategy. It's a marketing principle, but it works for all communication. Technical people, I love you, but you have the tendency when somebody is asking about what you do to jump, you start with the details. You jump in way too deep. You go way into the features of what you do. And that is a hard thing to communicate to people and make it meaningful to people who are not also in your field, who are not also uh, technically minded like you. However, if you explain the benefits of what you do, it helps introduce the value of what you do, and people will then go, oh, okay, I get it. So here's an example. Let's use roundabouts again. I do a lot of work with roundabouts. Standard, because roundabouts get a lot of, a lot of resistance around the country uh, when they are introduced into a community, but then almost universally, when they get their first roundabout and they see how well it works, they go, give us more roundabouts. But that first one is, is tough <laughs> to get out there. So we've thought about this a lot. A roundabout typically is a, is a circular intersection configuration. It's a, you, we've probably all seen them where you go in and cars are moving around and there there's usually two lanes in a modern roundabout. Cars are driving around and it helps you move through quicker. A roundabout replaces a traditional either stop intersection with signs or a signalized inter intersection where you come and everybody stops. And if it's a four-way stop, they all sit there and stare at each other like who goes first and all that stuff. The problem with those intersections is that they can be very dangerous. Uh, if there is a crash, if somebody runs the red light or runs the stop sign, we've all seen this, and then they'll T-bone a car right in the middle of the intersection and usually causes a serious or fatal 
crash. It, it's very serious when, when, when they happen in those intersections. So typically what you say is, well, listen, these crashes, and we've all probably had a story in our community where someone died at a four-way stop. And if I say things, if I were explaining the benefits of roundabouts, I go, look, if we put a roundabout in at this, the benefit of this is there is almost a 0% chance that anybody will ever die again at that intersection. We will drop fatal crashes to zero. Can it possibly happen? Yes. The statistics are almost nil. People will stop dying at that intersection. That's a benefit. <laughs> That's a major benefit. It's a benefit hard to hard to counteract and hard to argue against. And then people say, okay, well, okay, that sounds great. And it's going to save lives at this intersection. Well, how does that work, though? It's complicated. Then I can explain the features. See, I, I, you put it in the right order. Make it valuable to people. Make your ideas valuable by explaining benefits. And then they will let you talk about all the detailed features. I can say, well. It changes the angle at which cars enter the intersection, and that way it reduces the conflict points, all the, all the details. But don't start with the details, start with the benefits. Third, ask for questions. This is a very subtle thing. When you're talking to people and you get done with a certain part of your presentation, always ask if they have questions. And do not ask, did you understand what I just said? Do you understand that? If you ask people what they, if they understand, they almost always are going to say yes because most people don't want to admit they didn't understand what you just said. They don't want to sound, look like they, are in, they, they, they can't get it. But if you say, hey, do you have questions? Are there any questions for me about what I just said? You will get many more responses. They will not feel like they are, they are uh, being diminished by admitting they don't understand something. It's a very subtle little tip, but it really, really works well. And then last, a word about jargon. You probably heard communication people like me say, oh, never use jargon. Never, never, never. That's partially, that's not true. That's not true. Let me just say this. You should adjust, because jargon can be very, very effective and very and needed with certain audiences. So you adjust the level of your jargon that you use, the technical terms you use, based on your audience. For instance, if I'm talking to grandma at Thanksgiving and she says, what have you been doing this year? And I say, well, I've done a lot of campaigns for roundabouts. And I'll say, grandma, you ever heard of roundabout? Have you seen those round, you know, intersections that you drive through? She goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I am, for instance, talking to a group of safety engineers at the FHWA, I can say things like conflict points. I can say things, I can say these words that they understand. And it actually builds my credibility because now they know I understand. So you want to, you want to, and, I, and you don't want to talk down to your audience. If I went to FHWA and talked to the safety people, I go, hey, have you guys ever heard of a roundabout? It's those round intersections. I'm talking down to them. Of course they know. And I'm going to lose credibility. So you can use your jargon and you can adjust it based on your audience's understanding of what you're doing and saying. So that, those are my tips for explaining it to grandma. Let's move to visualization. This is a big one with technical people. And this is one that, I'll be honest, you all need, need a little work on, so let's, let's talk about this. This is a pretty standard just data table, and, and you all know your data people. That's what makes you great, is you can work with these big data sets and all this technical information and bring meaning and value to the world. The problem is, is that typically when you're presenting this information to people and you're showing it to them, you don't have something clean like this. You start doing this. Like you just start stacking up and putting tons of charts and let me show you a schematic and over here we have a graphic and here's a 3D rendering and let me show all this to you all at one time and dump it all on the slide. Now, as we all probably know if you're in the audience looking at that, you don't understand a thing. You're not taking in that information. And how many times have you heard someone say, "Well, you see this chart. You probably can't. You probably can't see what's in here. You probably well. But you know what? You probably can't tell what's down there." If you have to say that in your presentation, that's a big red flag. You should change your presentation if you have to say those words. You're probably not going to understand this when the entire point of the presentation is to help people understand it. So 
So here's so, but it is important that you all visualize data. It's what you do. Here are some tips on how to do it well, how to visualize complex topics well. Let's go back to our data table. And the data, frankly, in this one are irrelevant. Your data will be your data, and it can be a bar chart or a table like this or whatever it is. First of all, one table at a time. In fact, I typically teach people when I'm doing public speaking training that in a slide deck, you should only have one idea per slide. One slide, one idea. One concept, one slide. That's it. One table, one slide. That's it. It is free to make a new slide. PowerPoint does not charge you by the slide. You can always make more. So break up those very busy slides and make them one little discrete thought and data table or data piece at a time. Second of all, make it big. If you just have one on the screen, you can blow it up really big, which is helpful for your audiences. Third, you want to call things out. So if I had this data table, don't just stand there and say, well, if you look at the second column down in the third row, and then over there you'll see this number, and if you go back up and see the they can't do that. Remember, you're very familiar with this data. Your audience is likely not. They may have never seen this before. And so you have to walk them through like this. Go ahead. So notice here where I just circled that 30,000. Let me tell you what that means. And then look over here. This 6,000, let me tell you how that relates to this. And over here, let's, let's pay attention over here now. And see that number? And this number? And this? You're calling things out. You're, in other words, you're holding my hand and you're walking me through your data to pull out the relevant items, and so I can follow you. Now I go, oh, okay, I don't have to absorb all of this. I can just look at that number. Now, the most important thing about this, as you're showing people these things, is to tell them what each of them means. Remember, benefits over features. So if I say, this 30,000 represents this number, and here's what that means to you. Here's, here's why you need to know what that means. And then go to the next one. Explain the benefit. And now what you're doing, you're humanizing your data, you're communicating your data better, and you're, you're being more attuned to the needs of your audience. This all comes down to being attuned to the people that you are communicating with, getting in sync with them, and giving the information to them in ways they need it to really absorb it. They will thank you for it. They will connect with you. And if you're in sales or in marketing or whatever it is, this is the number one business development tips that you can do. So I'm going to do a quick review. Your pro tips are to use analogies. Think really hard about what you can do to translate your information into analogies. Second, explain it to grandma. Give it a try this Thanksgiving. <laughs> Explain it to your mother, explain it to your grandmother, and see how, see how well you do getting in tune with her. Visualize. Visualize well, though. Use those tips for, uh, for data visualization, and you will be a much, better, much more effective. So here's some next steps. So what do I do with this? Well, okay, Kevin, this is great. Give me some practical things. Like, what, how do I start to deploy this? First of all, read those books. Read the books that I gave you, I promise. There's much more information in those books than I'm certainly able to give you in just a few minutes. So get into those books and dig deep. Next, pull out your latest slide deck. Just randomly grab the last slide deck you used in a presentation, and I want you to evaluate that deck based on what I have just presented to you. One table, one slide, calling things out. Go back and evaluate and then adjust your latest slide deck and see if it doesn't make it better. Third, create one analogy. Okay, go back, go just think about the work you do. And if you were to explain what you do in an analogy, say, it, what I do is like this. What is it like? Create one and then try it out on somebody and see how it, how it resonates with them. See how it works. I'll bet you it works really well. And then you'll start to get into the you'll get into the practice of thinking that way. How can we make this into an analogy? That is the next thing. And then deliberate practice. So as you go through here, if you are an introvert or you are an extrovert, think about those specific items you can do to create better attunement. If you need to listen more, next time you're in a group, 
try to deliberately go, okay, I'm going to listen, I'm going to stop talking. If you are more introverted, maybe you will say, okay, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Be deliberate about it. And it doesn't have to be a sweeping change. One little change can make a big deal. Ask a follow-up question and say, hey, what did you think about that? Or let me ask you on this and see and watch how people will connect with you. They will. They'll get really, they will just lean into you and, okay, so that specific deliberate practice, trying to get closer to the middle where the ambiverts are, will help you improve instantly. If you do these things, I promise, I promise, I've seen it many, many times, you will be better right away. And you will continue to get better every time you practice these tips. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike because before we do a little Q&A, which we're going to do, if you haven't already, please throw questions into the, into the chat pod. I can't see the chat pod, but Elena and, and Mike are checking it. So please load all your questions in there, and then I'm going to turn this back to Mike for a, uh, a short time and then back to Q&A with you all. So, Mike. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was uh, very informative. Um, I like the opportunity to improve and uh, make changes instantly. That's, uh, that's something I think everybody can take away and, and is extremely valuable. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, like Kevin said, if you do have any questions, please begin submitting those now and we will get to those, uh, as many of them as possible in the time available. We do have a few minutes left here to uh, address some questions. And we do hope you enjoyed today's presentation and that you will, you will join us uh, for our future webinar Wednesdays. And the next one that we have scheduled is for December 8th, uh, so next month. And the topic will be pavement marking mobile retroreflectivity data collection uh, and hosted and presented by Carmen Dwyer, a senior engineer with ARA. And we have many more exciting topics and ARA presenters in the works for 2022. And please watch your email for updates or visit the Webinar Wednesday webpage, www.ara.com forward slash webinars. Next slide, please. And we've reached the uh, point in our time where we can start to uh, address some questions. And uh, we will uh, continue to uh, get through questions as many as we can uh, until just before the end of the hour. Um, we'll start out with one that's come in. Uh, I'm very introverted and I don't have a big personality. Should I try to speak louder or be more boisterous in my presentations? Very good question. Again, I get that a lot because I'm, so if you could see me sitting in my office right now, when I talk, I'm, I'm, I talk with my hands, and I do like windmills with my hands. It's, and people sometimes will say, do I have to do that? It's like, is that what I have to try and emulate when I'm speaking in front of people? And the answer is absolutely not. No, no, no. Um, I tell people the most effective communication for you is to communicate, the, talk the way you talk. How do you talk when you're with your friends? What level of voice do you use? I, I happen to talk just like this. This is not a presentation personality for me. This is me. This is how Kevin, this is how I, my wife and daughter will tell you, it's like, geez, Kevin, could you just, you know, I just, this is how I talk. And so it's not a presentation skill I've learned. It's just what I do. However, some of the most effective presentations I've ever seen out of professionals and also students are very quiet, very reserved people. Because there's something even in that, that if, if your voice is quieter and you can bring it down and you're slower and more paced, it helps people to listen. Just because you're loud and, and hyperactive like I am doesn't make you better off necessarily. The number one thing is to be you, however you talk. And that will be more natural. Your audience will be more attuned to you. They will pick up that you're not faking it. You're not, you, this is who you are. And you will be a better communicator. So no, that's the good news. Do not change your personality to put on some kind of presentation persona. All right, thank you, Kevin. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, is it generally true that extroverts are energized by engagement? 
whereas introverts can be drained by engagement with others? And if so, how can people use that knowledge to help their communication and engagement skills? Very good question. That is absolutely true. So that is the defining characteristic between an introvert and an extrovert. There are, there are several others, but one quick thumbnail way to know if you are lean one way or the other is after you have been in a public engagement of any kind. It could be a cocktail party. It could be Thanksgiving, whatever it is. How do you feel? Do you feel energized? Are you excited about that? Or do you feel drained? Are you tired? Do you need to go be alone and be quiet and calm down? That is absolutely true. Inter extroverted people thrive on crowds. They, it makes them feel more energized when they are around people. And they are actually bummed out and kind of drained when they are alone. Introverts are the opposite. You will feel exhausted after, a, okay? And you will, it will take out of you. It takes work. Believe it or not, I don't know if you do or not, but I actually lean that way. When I do a presentation like this, it, it wears me out. I thoroughly love it, by the way. I enjoy it thoroughly. I, I, I love doing this kind of thing, but it, it, I will, my brain will be tired the rest of the day. I promise. Because it, it, it does take out of me to, to do that. So, but you can, you, you can know that about yourself, right? So when you have, if you are introverted, say, and you know that that presentation or that inter interaction is going to take it out of you, it's going to require a lot of energy, it would really, really help, one, to get good sleep. That I can't overestimate that. Get good sleep the night before. And second is just spend the time before your meeting completely alone. Just let yourself rest. Try not to stack up two or three of these public engagement things in a row. Let yourself be introverted and let yourself sit there and just be quiet. And whatever it does it for you, whether it's music or whatever, and charge those batteries right before you go into that public meeting. And then you can expend your batteries and you'll be good to go. Then you can go away and, and you know, <laughs> and be tired and, and uh, recharge in whatever way that it is for you. Um, so, yes, I, I, and by the, I understand that completely. Um, if you are energized by crowds, and that is your thing, it's going to be obviously much easier for you to interact in those situations. But because you are energized by them, please be careful. Don't fall into the extroverted trap of talking too much and being too much and not listening enough. You need to tone back that energy a little bit so you can attune to the people in the audience. So I hope that helps. I think that will, Kevin. Great answer there. Um, and uh, we'll move to our next question that's come in. Do you have any tips for recovering during a presentation after you realize that you've gone into too much detail and lost the audience's understanding? Yes. Okay. That's what a good question. So the um, first of all, I applaud that person for noticing that they went too deep, for paying enough attention to go, okay, whoa, 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 I lost you. Here's what I would say. If I were in a live group, and this is hard virtually, everything's harder virtually, I, I won't lie. But if you're in a live group and you realize, okay, I just went way down too deep for these people, you should say so. Literally stop what you're saying and go, wait a minute, did I just go way too deep? You will see instantly in your audience, they'll be like, uh, yes, yes, come back up for air. <laughs> in other words, just admit it. Just say, okay. If they say, no, 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 we're right with you, that's cool, keep going. Then okay, keep going. But if you stop, yourself, that will do two things. First of all, it will bring you back into better attunement with your audience and their understanding level. The second thing it will do is it will endear you to your audience because you were, you were humble enough to admit that you, that you went too deep. They will love you for that. If you say, hey, okay, whoa, 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 I feel like I just went like, into another place. Did I lose you all? And if they say, yeah, they're going to they're gonna love, they're going to appreciate you for saying, for noticing that, for noticing them. Remember, attunement, perspective taking. You are paying attention and responding to their needs in real time. There is nothing more powerful in communication than that. Great, thank you, Kevin. Good answer there. That's a tough uh, spot to be in if, you, uh, if you're worried that you've lost your audience. So uh, that's a great feedback and, uh, and uh, tip for being able to recover that situation. 
one more question here. Uh, how do you feel about reading speaker notes during an online presentation? I, I would encourage against, I would discourage, in other words, using speaker notes ever, ever. Now, I know that is controversial, and I have an entire presentation, as a matter of fact, on public speaking where I have a whole section of that one called Lose the Notes. I can't give all the details right now, but I, I don't know if we have that one recorded or not, or maybe I'll do that one again, and um, or I talk about that. Um, you should not depend on notes of any kind. You should prepare your presentation well enough that you can look at an image or you can look at a data table or you can look at a, a couple of bullets on the screen and that's all you need to explain what you need to to your audience. Depending on speaker notes, whether it's virtual or otherwise, it's a crutch, it is a booby trap, it will hobble your presentation skills and it will, it will not do what you think it's going to do. You think it's going to help, it will actually not. It's going to make your presentation stale. It will make it will disengage with people. It will show that you are not attuned to people. I'm not a fan, and we can uh, I can you can follow up with me later, and I can kind of explain why if you want, or maybe we can do another webinar uh, on public speaking, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, great feedback on that one, Kevin. And uh, like he just offered, uh, the, as it shows there on the screen, if you do have questions further for Kevin uh, after today. Uh, he's available via email for the next 24 hours uh, at kelliot at ARA.com. We've got one more quick one that I want to uh, serve over to you, Kevin. Any tips for dealing with the lack of feedback from virtual or and or cameraless presentations? Yes, it is hard. I, I told you a few times here because so in communication, we know this, the people who are communication scholars, the numbers vary, but it, but it ranges from 50 to 70 percent. It's a lot of our communication is nonverbal. It is based on everything but the words. So facial expressions, body language, all of those things. I have we cut those off. It is very hard as a communicator. So here's what I here's one tip I recommend that you can do is one to end your presentations. If you can, put humans in them. You've noticed I put people in my presentations because it now it's, you know, that it's a human connection. The other thing is, is it helps sometimes to put a, put a photo of a human being, literally put a picture of a human being on your screen while you are presenting and pre do your presentation to that person in that picture. I know it sounds weird and it's going to feel awkward, but I promise it's better. You can talk to that person. It will just help you talk more like a human being, as if you were. As far as feedback, you, that one is just tough. I can't tell what you are noticing in real time and what you are not. If I have a smaller group, sometimes I will break my presentations up into little sections where I can go, okay, I just finished that section. What do you think about that? And get some feedback in little segments as we go along. Bigger groups is not possible. It's just hard. But those are a couple of little tips to help you humanize it a little bit. Oh, that's great, Kevin. Thanks so much. And that's going to wrap up our question session here. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Kevin's available via email for the next 24 hours for any additional questions. We do ask that you keep those informal and informational and not consulting questions for Kevin. Um, on behalf of ARA, we do want to thank you for joining us and, and, uh, and listening along today. Uh, the presentation was recorded and a link will be made available on the ARA Webinar Wednesday website early next week. And we will also send a PDH certificate to all participants verified by our attendance report as present for the full hour of the webinar. And a copy of, the, of today's presentation will also be included uh, with that uh, submission of the certificate. Please allow a couple of weeks to receive your certificate. Uh, and definitely contact us if you have any questions. Uh, ARA is always looking for great people to join our team. If you're interested in employment opportunities with ARA's transportation and infrastructure offices, uh, we do encourage you to send a brief resume and contact information to www.joinara at ara.com, and uh, we would be happy to hear from you there. Next slide, please.
And uh, one more uh, thank you for joining us today. Hope you will join us again in, on December 8th for our next webinar Wednesday, which will be Pavement Marking Mobile Retroreflectivity Data Collection uh, presented by Carmen Dwyer. Uh, one more thank you for your attendance today and uh, wish you well, stay safe, and we'll see you next month.